to you, our facilitator uh, for this learning exchange, Mr. Saraj Syed.
but with Amari, like, I mean, he's, a, he's just a regular kid, you know, he's been thrown into a situation that he wasn't looking for, you know, he's going through a lot, he has a girlfriend, you know, he has a mom and a dad, you know, he wasn't really, he's got thrown into a situation a little bit, um, which I kind of felt like I kind of took some, uh, like, past, sorry, I guess, uh, some stuff from, but he's just a regular kid trying to, like, live, like he said, get through the week, um, and he's going to the school searching for opportunity, and yet he get, like, you know, this kind of side plot of, like, a teacher coming at him, and also with his girlfriend, you know, complain, like, I'm pretty sure, you know, you guys see how Jasmine is, I'm pretty sure she's like that all the time, and so he has to do with that all the time, so, like, you know, he loves his girl, he tries to make her happy, you know, he tries to make his mom happy, he tries to make his dad, who he wants to have a relationship with, but, like, it's not really connecting that way, and it speaks from a lot of, like, as a black man, like, I mean, I never personally, my dad has always been there in my life, like, I've never had that situation, but I know someone who has, I know of a cousin, I know someone who I'm close with, who can I get experience that with, so playing with Mari is, like, I feel like it's bigger than me, because it's, like, yeah, like, I'm, like, kind of, like, representing the black boy, and, like, I mean, it's that coming of age, I mean, it's that coming of age to knowing how to deal with a situation like that, when you, you don't even ask for it, and then other stuff comes behind that when you're asked other questions and that make you go think, you know what I mean, doubt yourself a little bit, make you go crazy a little bit, make you go like, I'm not understanding. And I feel like with Amari, that was like the hardest thing because I put a lot of emotion into the, sh like, into the character and it's so easy because I have been where he has and it's so easy to just let it go. And I'm thankful for Brad for bringing the show to me for Stephen to allow us to do this. I'm thankful for you guys for coming and experiencing this with us. But Omari is just a, he's a very complex character. And I just try to take what I know from what I've learned and what I've experienced and give you guys. Well, I just want to say you did an amazing job. Because you're an amazing actor in yeah. the way that you brought all that emotion forward. But I also want to say, like, my students rock. You guys can just turn the conversation around if you want. You're looking really, some of you are looking really tired. So you don't want to have to speak for a while. And you can just ask them what they thought or uh, get some opinions out of them. Because we've basically been studying racism in relationship to madness since the 17th century. We did a whole unit on the 18th century melancholia on slave ships. We did a lot with colonial Africa and ra racism there and how that affected production of different kinds of symptoms. And this is our, you know, I mean the class, What is Madness was really, the title really came because we're living in the era of Trump and we get new definitions every day about what, what is the definition of madness. But if you want to listen, I think you'll be able to get some, some reactions out from, from uh, my students. But it's your show, it's your thing. But I just wanted to get Let's go with Brad. Yeah, well then I'd love to ask a question. So, I mean, based on your studies and what you've seen, I think one of the interesting things that this play brings up is that um, there's a historical perspective to the anger that is held within these, these boys who fight in the school in C8. And I'm just wondering, what connections do you see there, if any, to you know previous historical like looks into madness or into just general, um, melancholy is a nice word, I guess, but I mean, it, wow, that's a, it's a melodramatic word. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like what connections do you see to the anger that this play is trying to talk about, the, the, the madness that this play is suggesting? Anybody? Man, all those hands. Come on, Hi. let's get them up. There is extra credit involved here. She said it. I mean, she wants to say it. <laughs> Isaac O. <laughs> Anyone to tell me about Isaac O? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's think a little bit about, you know, kind of find our way into that, right? Listen to what Omari just saw, well, what Leo said, but it's Omari's character. This idea that it's just life, right? You guys can relate to that. It's your background, circumstances, where you've come from, how you found your way here, trying to navigate this space. It's a big school. 
interpersonal relationships, whatever the case is, that's all the stuff that his character is navigating. And yet, there is this entire historical precedent that is just weighing down on him. Other people are seeing him that way. They don't see him, they see it. So who feels like that? You guys walk around feeling like you're seen? Is there, are there aspects of your character that aren't seen? Is that something that you can relate to? You? Or do you guys have awesome lives? <laughs> How about for you guys? Give me a sense of that. No one's looking. No. Let's go okay, yes. I personally can't. But I have many friends from even the school that I went to that are still in high school that have had something like that to an extent. Like every time he travels north, for instance, he would get like dirty looks just because of his race. Yeah. And it kind of, I can see how it affects his life negatively. Yeah. Why the dirty looks? Why do you think? What does he say? He just notices one. He doesn't really know why particularly. Yeah. 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 You know, I'll give you a perspective on that. Right, it's something that I didn't necessarily share before, but when I first came down to Florida, I had come from grad school, and uh, I was working in schools around the county, a lot of rural counties right around here, and I worked with families, with members of uh, their household, when you know, child was having some kind of behavioral issues, whatever the case is, and um, you know, there was a, a moment out in uh, Gilchrist County where there was a, a grandfather that was raising all these young kids, mixed race, right? I wasn't sure about how that was all gonna go and what that meant to him. Didn't even have time to stop to make any of that and process it and uh, deal with his own prejudices, right? And so in the best possible way, at a time when this man's grandson came through a particular process of growing, of coming into a new understanding about something, he said to me, in the most honest way, and I come down from New York, right? I grew up in Brooklyn, came down here, went to school up in Boston, and came here and he said, you know, you're okay for a color fellow. And that was 1990, right? So it wasn't decades and decades ago. And I understood that in that moment as a real expression that was coming through layers of historical context, right? So that's what we're trying to get to here, right? This understanding that you have that Dr. Hunt was talking about in terms of who is the person again that you had asked about? Isaac O. Isaac O. So I know a little bit about Isaac O because she told me, right? So who can, who can fill that in a little bit? How do you relate Isaac O to the character of Omar, even Naya, in this particular play? Man, those, those finals are coming up soon. What are you going to do with that? The pressure will be off. Right? Hey. Isaac O was a patient in 1931 in Nigeria and he was finally diagnosed with acute mania. But clearly he was responding to a very complex colonial context of racialized hate. And, um, and it was also, he was, he, he was in out of schools. There was an expectation for him to succeed in school. And his, I mean, today, the acute mania, they would call it bipolar, but the, it was kind of a violent side that came out of him, a kind of rage. And it, there's, I mean, it's a stretch, but it's a parallel. There's a parallel between colonial Africa and, you know, the U.S. South today in terms of what it means to several of them throughout the play and how, what, how the psychiatric category comes into play in relationship to what's going on. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of sadness. Melancholia is sadness or depression. Mm -hmm. There was, that was, a, you know, there um, more in the women characters. Um, so. and, um, and actually, uh, Kirby's uh, character, June, speaks to that. He actually refers to it as the legacy. He does. He speaks of it as our legacy. Um, I can I can definitely relate. You know, um, growing up, you know, black man in the south. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like the messages. You know, we tell our story, and you know, I grew up hearing my parents' story. I am the first generation in my family, first generation outside of segregation. 
So both my parents grew up in a segregated South, having to know their places. So when you know, it came time for me to go to school, I had to learn their history. I had to learn what it was like to, um, you know, how I should conduct myself. I had to understand that there was a double standard in our society. I mean, I had to like be educated in my culture and what in our history before I can even walk out the front door and just know that I was going to be bombarded by a lot of these things. So I can imagine what a young black person is going through who's growing up in Omari's case, where he has to learn, he or she has to learn all these other things, all of our history, and at the same time, deal with all of this new stuff that's coming at them. I, can, I mean, it's like, it, I, my mind just goes, whoa, you know? Because at one point, I used to think to myself, oh, well, you know, I would see a young person in Omari's case or Jasmine's case, and I'd say, oh, you know, we'll just get off your, your butt and, you know, just deal with it, you know? But no, it's like, it's, it, it's, it is more, it becomes, I think it becomes really more intense for the younger generation. And that's how I'm seeing it. So, um, and I don't know, you know, because, you know, Kevin, definitely Kevin, you, you're, you're the youngest one on, in the cast here yeah. with us. I mean, and, you know. yeah, I feel like growing up, like, being a black child, uh, like, I mean, my parents would never sat me down, like, okay, listen, like, you know, see the phone, be like, you know, they never did that. But, like, what Jasmine Perry says, you can smell when you don't make sense of somebody. And that's what I experienced. Even when I didn't know what it was, I knew it was something. And that's what a lot of, I feel like, black youth go through. But then, like Omari, in his case, like Naya said, I have tried to shield you and da 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 da. So she has done a good job of shielding this boy from all of that. Him being thrown into this situation, I think it's a point in our lives where it's direct to us. It's our coming of age, so how we experience it and what we're going to do with it. And for Mari's case, because she was, because she has one, because she's an she's an educator, so he knows, you know, he knows, he knows how to act. He knows how to, you know, he, he's a good boy. He's a he's a good kid, but he was thrown in a situation, and he had to, and it's that's his y'all. That's the experience that y'all are getting. It's him going through his life, and it's like really the woke moment for him. Because we had it at different, I had it at a young age, not at, as a martyr, because I was a, a ballet dancer. I, I studied ballet, that's what I did as a kid. I learned really quickly that I was different in the room. Y'all feel me saying that? And also, it's not because I was a boy, but because of something, though, because it's, it's the elephant in the room. And you know, and that's, all, and that's, I feel like a lot of people get that, and that's why I said that Martyr is a complex character. He's not that simple. Because it's not, it's not a simple thing. He's not, it's, these are things, these are. These are real people that go through things. And that's what I love about it is that like it's just there. And you guys can take it. Like how Mari took what happened and he found his way. So now you guys have a chance to listen to it and find, you know, ways, you know how you guys look at things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know, he Kevin just um Leo just put out a good point. He said, um, you know, you could smell when you don't make sense to somebody. Um, that really, really did because I'm thinking back to my freshman year of college. Um, I was heavily involved with a white woman at that point in time, and her father was extremely racist and all, but he masked it. So literally, um, she would show me text messages where her father would say like the N word, all this, and he hates X, Y, Z. And you know, one day I just he owns a very popular bagel shop. I just walked up in his bagel shop, just ordered food, and I could sense that vibe. But he still took care of me, you know, excellent customer service, all that extra stuff. But literally, his eyes and all, I, like, I saw the hate attention. And then, once again, now if you knew your daughter was involved with a black man, it would have been like, woo! <laughs> you know, it went, he would probably went ballistic. But that was my first encounter of like, holy sheesh, this is an issue that's out there. And then it's masked a lot of the time. So, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there since he brought you can smell when you don't make sense to somebody. So. Yeah, because sometimes it doesn't have to really be about like you can know your like you can know your history because I mean we we, we we're kind of forced, but it's like it's kind of something that kind of comes up our history of like what happened or whatever. 
whatever on um, the case. But um, it's, I feel like it's more being aware. It's just like it's, it's you can read all the things you want to read, but like I mean, it's just like it's that's what, about these people. I mean, they're just everyday people. It's not. I mean, yes, she's a teacher. Yes, she's educated. You know, but I mean, it's just being aware. There's nothing that that Amar because he had a situation because his mom's is an educated woman that I mean it's going to happen, you know, so I just feel like it's just about being aware, you know, so, like, you know. And then there's also, there's only a certain amount of time that your parents can shield you from all that. You, know, <coughs> you get to a certain age and point, you're going to go out in the world and just, you just got to be able to deal with this moving forward. And I'm like, you know, as a black man, I, I'm not going to say I experience it a lot, I don't know, but I know it's out there, but I don't let myself get too, you know, caught up in it. No, I'm just trying to be the best person I can be, and all, so. Yeah, I guess I have uh, more of a question um, with uh, the topic of madness, rage, anger. Um, I was telling uh, the rest of the past backstage that with everything that's played, everything I'm like, oh my god, it's so good, it's so good, it's so relevant, I totally get it. Um, but then there's this one line that has been really bothersome for me, and it's the line that Naya says when she says that, like, the rage is inherent, um, like, it's an inheritance, and um, just hearing, like, a little bit about, like, madness and, like, the long uh, history of that, I think it's, um, I'm very curious as to know, like, the, the definition that you guys are using to, um, to describe madness, rage, all of that, because um, I think that there, for me, there was definitely a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know, like reluctance to like fully accept just that line in the script because as a black woman there are so many stereotypes about our um, terms of expression. So, you know, we talked last week just about Jasmine and how she's very forthright, aggressive, and assertive in her language. And to a lot of people who are not used to, you know, African American vernacular English or just like the cultural expression of being like in your face and very direct communication, um, she can be seen as someone who is filled with rage or angry or whatever. She's not angry, she's just frustrated and she's hormonal and she's a teenager. She happens to be black and so a lot of these uh, expressions are very different and um, it, kind of atypical to what mainstream media kind of puts forth. Um, so I guess, you know, being a black woman and being very sensitive to the stereotypes um, regarding like angry black woman, hostile black man, there's so much aggression, there's so much, um, you know, just like rage, um, I'm very curious as to know how those things relate to those stereotypes um, and, and what's kind of the space where there is um, space to recognize that the emotion that comes forth oftentimes in people of, of color comes from desperation, depression, um, you know, extreme burden, like just like a very like heavy life. How is that? How is that different from the expressions of rage and madness that you guys are writing about? Please. Yes. Uh, I think one of the most interesting uh, read things about the definition is how circumstantial it is and how much it applies to the situation and what exactly you're looking at. So you can't really take it across time and keep one definition, it'll always be changing along with how history is always changing and as we move forward, different uh, things are created, different social, social environments are created. And I think this production really strikes that example, one of those examples, and the many ways that oppression has been seen in society over the years. And I don't know what else to tell you. Sometimes the madness is in the no-go. Sometimes it's in the context. Sometimes it's in the context. That we have at this point in this country, this producing a kind of madness with so many black men going off to, to jail. Mm -hmm. And you can see, I mean, it was a madness, one could say, to, to you know, the slave trade, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it wasn't perceived that way um, at the time. And then I'll just make one more comment, which is, 
This week we read Winnicott. Winnicott is a British uh, child a psychoanalyst, and one of his big remarks is about, he talks about the relationship between the mother and child, how the mother has to be a good enough mother. It's back in the 50s, there's no men or fathers inside his world who's in charge of kids. But there's also the sense that the, which came through very strongly in the play, that if the larger context has to hold you, if the larger context is, is um, pathological, that then, then people suffer and people go wrong inside that context. And so a racist school where the child is being attacked and pointed out by the teacher, there's something pathological in that. And that kid was being rational to try to tell that story to his mother. His mother, for some reason, was unable to get it, you know. But I also thought that the contrast between the two young characters, the couple, why is it that the, it's the woman who's the healthy one? So we don't learn about her family, what, what is that larger context there, or, but you, to me it was, you were, you were like a street version of Michelle Obama. I will go to stage to me. I'll tell you how it is, and just very wise. You were like the wise figure of the, of the yeah, I've said that. Was there a hand back here? Oh, no, I'm in. Okay. <laughs> okay. thrown into a whole new environment, perspective, people. And a lot of the times our parents try to push us, like in this example, to move forward into a better world or into a better school, but sometimes that's more harmful because we do not fit in and we do not understand. And with the lack of understanding yields frustration. Yeah. And I think that is where a lot of rage and anger can come from, mm -hmm. just internalized, not necessarily obviously across all races and genders, but just as part of humans, we are trying to understand the world, and I think that's part of where the rage comes from. Not Good. understanding. Right. Very nice. So now that it's up, why don't you get force of mind into this? <laughs> drives my idea of where these characters get their confusion, their anger, their rage, any of that. And for me, when, when the young lady back there said, um, put into a totally different world, some place that they're not used to, what that struck me as being is that as children, all of us, up until a certain level, are basically what we would call innocent. And that innocence for a white person in our community, in our society, gets chopped down in little tiny compartmentalized areas of our life. We might hit that day when we realize we're no longer an athlete. And that little tiny part of our life is different now. We hit that time when we, we find, you know, like this little thing in our life might not work. You know, somebody calls me a name and suddenly that friendship has to go away. What I kind of see through this story and, and, you know, dozens of others is that there's a time in the life of a black child where they have to realize that half the world is against them. <clears throat> You hear that silence? What if you had to suddenly figure out that half the world was against your existence on a level playing field with them? That's more than stubbing your toe. That's more than breaking your leg. It's more than falling out of a tree. It's more than losing a parent. That's your life is suddenly something completely different that you never knew was there. And you have to live in that. And, for, and that sit down and talk with a child to try to tell them of the dangers that Naya talks about in scene five with, with, with Jasmine. Do you know what it's like to send your son out there every day? Like that talk happens in, in situations all over. 
You know, and I'm not saying that it's absolutely 100% unique to black students, obviously black children, black whatever, but I'm just saying that that's something that's way bigger, and I think that that probably has, I mean, when you add that into our, you know, you don't like the word, but, you know, inheritance, you know? It's like bringing it all up again. It's making all that happen again. And that, that hurts. I mean, it hurts me. You know, a few weeks ago, um, Brad asked, he, well, he said, he was like, hey, you know what, I'll never, I'll never really know how it feels to be black or just go through the black experience and all. And um, it is nerve wracking at times. Like, for instance, a few weeks ago, I got a ticket and I shared the story with Richard Reed, but instantly in my mind, a cop pulled me over. I didn't know all the specifics regarding the move over law and things like that, but I got a ticket for that. But instantly when he pulled me over, I dropped all my windows, and I just immediately, I couldn't hear him, so I immediately put my hands out the window. And then I still couldn't hear him, so I got out the car and just stayed on top until I got it, like this all clear signal from him to move forward and all. So, like I was saying before, I kind of can be nervous, because you're always like, man, as I move up, like, am I gonna, you know, possibly be killed just because of my color or, or what? So that's, that thought always lingers behind our heads sometimes, so FYI. Put your hand up here. Me. Oh, please, go for it. Um, I think there's another dimension to the story of not belonging, not only by um, race, um, but also by nationality. There are a lot of immigrants. Um, I know that I share that with people in my classroom. I'm not from here. This is not my first language. And sitting in a classroom at a very young age, looking at the board and not understanding what's on it, and being laughed at for it, you grow very quickly, and you understand that you have to fight a bigger battle than everyone else, and you need to work twice as hard to earn the same respect. Even though in your country, you might be a lawyer, the minute you step here, you are no one, and you are nobody, and no one's gonna respect you the same, because they think this place is theirs. But who took it from the natives to begin with? So there's a whole other dimension to this of not belonging, not just race, not just gender, but nationality. Yeah. So it's, it's so crazy to say that because I just left Savannah and when I was in Savannah, I visited this place called St. Thomas Slave, St. Thomas and Slave Quarters, right? I walked in there, I got to get the whole, literally it was where the slaves used to live and do all that, where they worked and, um, one of the biggest points you like once oh my gosh, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> oh, what was that one? Yeah, it's been a long day. Where'd you go? Ah, that's funny. I said when it comes back to the outfit. <laughs> no, um, actually, um, I'm glad you brought up that point that it it definitely goes past race, you know, it's nationality. Um, because like it's it's so interesting you say that because that's one of this, the one of the lessons that we learn mm -hmm. in, um, in in our, our, our in black communities is that we're taught we have to be just as good to get at least half of what our counterparts, our white counterparts have. Mm -hmm. Twice as good, really, mm -hmm. to get just as half, mm -hmm. just get half of what mm -hmm. our white counterparts. Mm -hmm. So you can you imagine the pressure, yeah. you know, and like you said, and not belonging. And to have to hear that from your parents has got to be disorienting and, and just disillusioning. I mean, could you imagine, you know? Uh -huh. I don't feel like there's an aspect of if you are good enough, like if you work twice as hard, people are surprised. Oh, okay. like I've had people come up to me saying that I speak white, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Slave quarters and Savannah, right? So we toured the place, all this, and then I saw a portrait. 
And it's crazy because a lot of the plantation owners and slave owners, right, who had all the money, guess where all of them went, went to? And a lot of them, were, they were pinpointing that out to them like, man, they went straight into politics. They became Congress. They became lawmakers. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, so when you made the point that this is their land, they started making all these rules. And, uh, and since we technically live in their land, we got to abide by it. If not, then, you know, you're outcasted. They'll call you some other type of whatever it may be. But, yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that. So. Uh, yeah, I'm excited that you guys talk about, like, um, just the, being, feeling foreign, um, especially with the way that you speak. Because um, I love, love, love that this play brought forth Winslow Brooks, um, who is fantastic. And uh, there was the contrast between the way that it's written as she intended and the way that it's written in these textbooks that are, you know, published and produced by, you know, mainstream white normative culture. Um, and so there's this issue also, you know, with black Americans, I know in particular, who have the issue of code switching. Um, and so while it's not a different language entirely, African American vernacular English has, it, it, it's a completely different system, has its own syntax, and there's actually a, a legit like way of, of um, that the syntax forms, and there's a right and there's a wrong way. And African American vernacular English is looked down upon, it's so frowned upon. And so I know that me as a child, I grew up in Liberty City. If you know Miami, you know you don't want to go there at night. <laughs> And I remember um, I started getting into like um, oratorical contests, which are just long, learn like very long speeches and then compete and say them. And um, I had this speech coach, and um, we would have to go through, and she would teach me, you know, like all me so that I could compete. And I remember we had this one session. I was in fourth grade, and I had to say the word ASK, which I know how to say now because I was traumatized. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, and so I said. You know, this is a very common way that black Americans say that word. Um, and so my teacher, the coach, like, looks at me and she's like, no, it's ask. The S is before the K. And I was like, what the heck? Wait, what's happening? Why is my world like changing so quickly? And so I remember it was ask and desks. Ask. And so it was this really, like, humiliating way. You know, I was a really great reader. I was a star student. And yet um, this teacher was kind of, uh, reteaching me how to speak in a way that was acceptable so that I could win this, you know, great prize of $50 and a pizza hut in Hong Kong. You know, um, and so uh, there is this otherness that that people feel um, whether they are from a different country or not. And I know that me as a black American, I definitely, definitely feel that way. And um, I just want to say that, um, like, code switching, I was a teacher over at Pace Center for Girls for a while. and. Um, it was something that I encouraged my students to do. It takes a, a huge ability uh, for students to be able to code switch, to know when to be able to go back to their native dialect, accent, whatever that is, language, and then to be able to come back into mainstream normative, normative culture and speak in a way that is acceptable and heard and understood. Um, so I really liked that uh, in Naya's lesson, there was the comparison between the two because our language, our accent, um, it, it's a place of belonging. And so I really liked that jazz and kind of kept that. She refused to be assimilated into this culture that she was kind of shoved into. Um, and I really liked that, uh, you know, you compare it to Michelle, Michelle Obama because yes. um, I think that it's so uncommon that we see a character like Jasmine who talks the way that she does and can still be, and it was one of the things that I remember having a conversation with, with um, Leo and Amanda. It's like, I don't know if people will be able to see Jasmine and hear her and still think that she is intelligent and kind and compassionate and smart and wise. Because usually when we see these kinds of characters, they are not intelligent and kind and compassionate and wise. Um, and so that really was very powerful. So thank you so much. <laughs> so let's bring this home. Okay. There's a lot that's been said that's really um, there's a lot of intersectionality here today. One thing that was really on my mind as we approached this nexus of everything that you guys are going through in terms of your studies, the kind of awareness you're building, and the kind of awareness this cast, this director, this uh, creative director of this space has brought into this community is kind of a, a level.
lesser seen narrative, the, the kind of notoriety of how underserved black American communities are, especially relative to mental health care, right? And if we can kind of try and pull that red thread through everything that we've experienced today, and I'm about to push a professor on the spot here. So, uh, Nancy, what do you think relative to the outcomes of this kind of this play, this kind of awareness that comes out? Is there a pathway forward, especially through creative arts, like this performative arts, to bring this kind of idea into, as you say, to kind of shift the milieu, right? To, to bring a new awareness to say that sometimes madness occurs because we are forced to occupy different identity spaces. And that's just what we're forced to do in terms of our normal lives, whereas other members of our community may not be, right? So could that be something that is, um, you know, that could lend itself to a pathway that could be diagnostic, I mean, in terms of understanding rage, understanding resentment, understanding lashing out, and not letting it be something that is um, generalized or stereotyped, but rather something individuated. So, please. Um, I don't know if I can do a good, quick answer to that. Oh, yeah. But I think, um, you know, the more that mental health care comes from the grassroots up inside our worlds, the better off one is. The moment you invite psychiatrists in with their diagnoses, their medications, your, your, which is not to say medications not, sometimes are not really important, but um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I, I have one foot always in the anti-psychiatry camp. I, I, and I think especially in poor black communities mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of stuff can do a lot of trouble. So what, what did strike me, the other thing that struck me in the play in terms of the, the script is just these two schools and so your class issues are continually there and when should I place my kid in the white school so they, they can get ahead and when is it actually better for their self-esteem and for their morale to keep them in a, in a more kind of ghetto school. And mm -hmm. my few experiences with, you know, the East Side School, which has got both layered on top of yeah. it, in the same building in this very bizarre way, is that, um, uh, I mean, whatever, that those um, uh, black, like, I, I, the more I've not been in the Deep South, too, I've wondered about just how the fact that. There, there's a gift in the fact that these communities remain in part very segregated. People have their communities, they have their spaces. They might be very poor spaces, but but they've got each other. And so I don't. I mean, that's just you know me coming in as an outsider, not knowing much about how that actually works on the ground. Because I know those those neighborhoods can also go toxic and be quite dangerous, and um, that's not at all be good for mental health. But I, I'm not sure the route of mainstreaming. People into the uh, into the more privileged schools is always best. Um, so I don't know. There's, there's a tension in the play. There's a tension in my mind around those issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's wonderful to have African American kids in my classrooms in, at the University of Florida. Those who, who made it <laughs> and are there and are doing it and you know have, have whatever things have happened well at, at home and they're, they're succeeding. So um, and I don't, I don't always see much being. Yeah. Professor Nancy, thank you very much for coming.